Cool. Um, so there was there was some uh, talk about the name. Do we do we want to address that tonight? Kind of having a consensus or not? I don't know, guys. So just to recap, uh, Lug was the original name, Linux user group. Yay, Lug. And then since we already get Richard Stallman, he recommended uh, or he mentioned, which is correct, to say GNU Linux because Linux is the kernel and GNU is the tools that created the opera to have the opera system together. And which I, I'm, I'm fine with that. Um, and then I introduced the idea to add another U to mean Unix, so GLUG, G L U U G, GNU Linux and Unix user group. Because I was thinking maybe we could talk about. Uh, more Unix like operating system or uh, proprietary Unix operating system. So um, there'll probably be less talk or less uh, interest in that unless you guys are, I don't know how, how you guys are about that. But um, so it's not a key thing, but I don't know, does anybody have any opinions on what they want to? I think we keep it simple. I like Lug. Yeah. Okay. Like because we got freshmen and stuff, and it's just like too confusing when you start having like, what is it again? And, and even Open MSM people are like, um, what oh, what is it called again? Open Semin. Um, so if you're just like log, people are like, okay, log. I can remember that. Leg. Yeah, Linux users group. Okay, that makes sense. And then they get in, and then we load them up with all the information about new and gnome and you know, system D and all that <laughs> dirty, dirty. Does everybody stuff. agree with that? I, mean, I think it my makes opinion. Sense. Keep my, it simple. My I mean, I think it's the best for people to remember it and advertise it. Okay, cool. Moving. Along. Say the story. Um, they're probably shouldn't eat this while I'm talking about something. They'll be a lot slower. Um, I'm done with the other one, but I'll show you that too. Uh, so, a few things. Docker 1.4 was released. And honestly, if I looked at this, but I don't remember what the, the event or what the additions were. The fix this. Let me quickly look at it here. Um, 23 vulnerabilities. The advisories are listed at this link. Uh, oh, they added the overlay file system. It's a new storage driver. Um, See what else we got. More security stuff. But they did add, in addition, uh, they're working on some new tools. They have Docker Swarm, <coughs> which is a clustering tool. Uh, we told, we briefly talked about it in, the, uh, in the prior meeting, um, but I haven't had a chance to play with it. So there's a uh, Swarm Composing Machine. Now, is, is this for coordinating apps that run across a multiple containers then? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think Swarm is for that, or Compose is for that. It's one that brings them up if they have dependencies. And Swarm is a way to, um, just quickly, just to make sure I don't have it wrong, um, distributed application. So it's a clustering and failure which is, okay, so you can have, you can run Docker, Docker on multiple hosts and then have your app or your Docker, your container run across those. So if the Swarm is, uh, is, looks like that's what they're trying to solve. And the other one was um, Docker machines. And this is log into the host and follow installation. Ah, that's a quick way to bring up VMs or um, provision your system for Docker. So it gets you running right away. So you can actually use a provider, you can use virtual machines in that case, or you can use AWS, Azure, VMware, and you can actually use that to spin up a Docker machine for you, and you can actually then uh, build your containers with that. Which, when I get some time to actually play with these, I'll, I'll talk about them. Uh, and if anybody else has experience with them, they can talk about them too. Um, so that's cool stuff. What else we got? Uh, Vagrant push. Oh, yeah, I didn't have a chance to look at this one. So Vagrant's got a new command out here. Okay, so it is a single uh, command to deploy any application. And let's see how this, that's three minutes. I don't want to watch all that. So define push FTP. Ah, okay. So you can actually push these to services. So the FTP one is a simple example. You're actually pushing the bigger information to an FTP system. Heroku, right, which has which uses containers. It's a way to serve your application. A lot of, a lot of businesses will use it for their web applications. And you can actually deploy your bigger uh, machine directly to Heroku in that case. And Atlas, I'm not familiar with Atlas, but it's a commercial product for Hash Corp. It probably does uh, the serving of uh, machines as well. So that's something that's new. Also a new one, uh, Vagrant. Um, 
do bigger uh, global status that came in the recent version. This actually tells you all the machines, that you, all the bigger machines you have on your system. So you can see I have this many that are actually up. And you can see I have um, Amazon Kindle on the way. But you can see that I have uh, two VMs running now with VirtualBox. I have uh, uh, two Gennetti uh, nodes. So this is a way to actually look at all your all your current running configurations of Vagrant. It's been it's, it's actually beneficial because before you had to go to each directory and type Vagrant status and we look for the dot Vagrant folder in there to get the status and see if it actually was a Vagrant configuration. Is anyone here not familiar with Vagrant? Okay, you. I've seen it before, but I never got it to work. Oh, okay. So it's a really cool tool. We're actually using Vagrant to build, to build our, our virtual machine infrastructure. And I use it at work. <coughs> we use it to, before we deploy, so essentially it's a, it's a wrapper. It's a Ruby wrapper around um, the provisioning of virtual machines. So you create a, a config file that tells you how to bring up the virtual machine, what our operating system to install. Like you give it an ISO or a Vagrant box or something. And what will actually happen is, you know, you don't read the file, it starts the, the provider, and bigger connection work with VirtualBox, uh, VMware, uh, and a few other ones, and you can actually type bigger up and it actually reads that file and will build a, a virtual machine for you right there. And um, one cool thing about bigger, it has the ability to do um, provisioning, so you can call like a shell script, which is one of the uh, provisioner type and a file that actually copy files from your host system to the VM, or you can have it, hey, after the machine boots, run this command or run this script to actually install all the software that you want. And the idea is you just create a text file, like a, a, you know, 100, 200 kilobyte text file or whatever, or depending on what stuff you have, and you give it to your developers and it solves the problem of, well, it doesn't work on my machine. So if you're developing an application and this guy doesn't have the right libraries or some, some version's off, it doesn't work on his machine, you can't test the stuff, you give him a Vagrant file, send it through email or put on Git or something, and they type Vagrant up with that file in there and it builds the machine with the exact specs as the person that created the file, so they, they're the same. Therefore, they can actually use the, same, the similar software and actually do their testing. So at work, before we even push out a virtual or build a new server, what we do is, so if I, like for example, I'm working on Cuckoo Sandbox. It's a malware analysis system. And before I even try to dig around with the hardware and, and install the operating system on that and, and, uh, and configure it all, I want to do it in a virtual machine because it's easy. I don't have to go messing with that, plugging all the cables, Break it if I if I if I mess up the configuration because I'm learning as I go. Then I can actually just do it in a VM with Vagrant and quickly spin up these things and practice. Like try try new commands, edit the configuration file, bring up another one. I can have this development environment for this. And I can give you a quick demo. It's really cool, and we'll do a future Vagrant talk if you guys stick around for those that haven't uh, seen it before. So, there's an, if you're running OS 10, there's a package. If you're running Windows, there's a package. You can run Vagrant on Linux as well. Uh, we can go to repos, Vagrants. This is mine. I have these are all these are all on GitHub. And can everybody see that all right? Yes? Uh, <laughs> all right, so for example, Sagan. So let's take a look at this one. So we're gonna look at the Vagrant file. This is the file that you pass around. And it's just a Ruby-like file that says, hey, I'm gonna configure a virtual machine with uh, a box of trustees. So Vagrant has the concept of box, boxes, which are prepackaged VMs. So if you wanna have an Ubuntu box, or you wanna install the Ubuntu operating system, you actually have to have the box. But luckily, like Ubuntu and many other Linux distributions will actually have the box available online. So you can go to cloud-images.ubuntu.com and you can download their Vagrant box. And so when I type Vagrant up, it'll, if it doesn't find it on the system as labeled as trusty, it will go out to the internet and download that box, pull it to my machine, and then start the box. And the virtual machine, I say box, I'm referring to virtual machine anymore, but you can say, hey, I want the virtual machine's name to be Sagan. I want it to have this much RAM. I want it to have utilized this many CPUs from my host. And at that point, once the box is up, it actually runs your provision stuff. You can say, oh, I'm copying this stop, the source file, sagan.upstart, to this direct or to this file on the host in the Vagrant home directory. And then eventually after that, what I do is I run a shell provisioner to run this provision SH script. If you look, we get out of here real quick, these files are right there. They're in the same directory. So there's my provision script right here. And it's just a, it's a shell script that says, hey, um, install my stuff. So I just give the list of packages that I want to install. This I wrote this script. Uh, but you can use any language you want, it'll run it. So Python, whatever else you want to run, as long as the script tells you how to configure the machine. So now literally, I type Vagrant up, 
Vagrants, let's actually see if I have that box ready. So vagrant status in the directory. So you actually just do make ER, you create a new directory, and then you type vagrant in it, and it creates a big blank state for you. But you can actually play with mine if you want. So not create it, so I can bring it up. Vagrant up. And what's actually happening is I look for that provider, that provider, it detects it, I'm using a virtual box. Now I was importing that trusty box, I already have it on my system, because I downloaded it in the past. And it's actually going to go ahead, and now it's done, I already copied it. Now it's uh, creating the network configuration. It set the VM, the host name, the, or the virtual, or the VM name right here, as Sagan, setting up ports for forwarding. And now it's actually configuring it ready for SSH, so I can just SSH right into the machine. And it already has a, a unsecure uh, public uh, private key com combination that's already, all machines will get that by default. You can set, so you can set vagrant space SSH and you're logged in the box and you can actually begin utilizing it. So, can you talk a little faster? No, yeah, yeah, actually I can. And if I'm too fast, let me know, I can slow down. Questions, just throw them out, I'll answer them. So at this point, we actually, I have a question actually, like off yeah. the top of that file, like what were those files that you were writing to places, like the the file, the Sagan, yeah. So these file, the file commands, uh, like right here, they're actually it's no, not that, like it was inside the the file, the the bigger file, the, the bigger file, yeah, yeah. So all of those like provision files, like what is, what is that? These, yeah, that was uh, that's, that was what I showed you. So what's actually happening is. Uh, it's taking a, a file from the host system and can copy it to the VM for you so you don't oh, have okay. to. It makes it easy. So in these cases, I'm just copying configuration files that I've already made and I know that work. Okay. So I just copy them to there. And then when I do my provision script, I say, oh, we'll get it out of the directory and copy it to like the appropriate Etsy directory, for example. Because you can't actually copy to like the full uh, uh, privilege path. You can only copy to the so home directory. you can directory. only count it to a home directory. Okay. Yeah. That's the same as uh, Docker in that way, sort of. Like yeah. well, in your Docker file, you, every oh no, every, every line like is a, a line from the home directory or from root directory. Right, right. Like, but you can yeah, yeah. That, that's that's true. That is true. So you have to specify you your CD because it'll just the next line will just be that exactly that's accurate. Yes. So you can see what actually happened was it ran those those file provisions right here, all four of them, and then so there's there's the four right here. And then it went to the shell provisioner. At this point. Here's the shell provisioner, and that's where it's running the shell script I wrote, installing all the packages for me for Sagan, and so I configure Sagan so that I can then do uh, log analysis. So um, now I'm, I'm quoting from the Git repo. So way to automate all this. The cool thing about this, though, is that you can just utilize other people's machines. Like you can go to GitHub.com, and you can type Vagrant, and then uh, I don't know MySQL probably. If you want to find, like, seriously, someone has a Vagrant lamp stack. If you don't want to take the time to build it yourself. Just clone this guy's repo and type Vagrant up and you have a LAMP stack. It saves you time. People have done the work already, so I just share these files yeah, online. Awesome. That's so sort of like, awesome. Here's one with Puppet and MySQL. Well, I highly recommend you. This saves you a lot of time in development. Just, just, there's there's tons, of, tons of stuff. So you can probably have it for web servers. There's probably a, a Docker one if you want to play with Docker, Vagrant Docker. I imagine someone's created a, some Docker ones. Look at here. Uh, this is for the boot for Docker script. A WordPress, so you can do all this stuff. This one's running MesoS, like CoreOS is another one. I know the CoreOS actually has their own Vagrant repository. So you can actually try out the CoreOS operating system. Like that. You literally just clone it and type Vagrant up in that directory. And as long as you have the provider, like VirtualBox, it'll actually do all the work for you because these guys have programmed it to do that. So I highly recommend checking out Vagrant. I don't want to make this a whole Vagrant talk, but it's a very cool tool. If you have any questions about it, you can ask me. Um, so let's get to the more of the news. We have Applied Crypto Hardening. This was a uh, website that is goal is to uh, give more practical information about cryptography to administrators. And um, so they, they released this document called uh, Applied Crypto Hardening. It's a PDF file. And essentially, it tries to teach you how to configure your servers with, uh, say, SSL or TLS in the best possible way that is that is known for uh, security. And they so. They go through all this. They've got examples on OpenSSH, Dovecot, Postfix, XM, Engine, Nginx, Apache, etc. So all these, just a guide on what you should do, how you should configure your machines, um, VPNs, tells you what, what ciphers you should use, which algorithms that are known to be the best. So it's a neat little project, and we'll keep updating this file as more and more people uh, contribute to it. And you can see there's a bunch of command outputs so you can actually do the testing and try it yourself. Um, secure, secure shell. This is a this is an article written that got some uh, popularity. 
Uh, my name is Chris Sides from Johnson the OpenBSD team for being um, slightly in in inaccurate, but it's pretty cool nonetheless. So essentially, Dear Spiegel, the German uh, newspaper, uh, it's a well-known German newspaper that's uh, known for its high-quality standards of journalism, and it uh, they had an argument, it had an article that was uh, written by a guy. They had some Snowden documents that released some information about how they were able to decrypt some of open some of SSH. And you can read that, you can go to the or at least that's quoted from the person. They don't have the details on that in the article anyway. So this based on that, they actually created this guy created an article to talk about the cryptography of it and uh, what settings you should have to try to avoid these situations where the NSA could potentially compromise um, the cryptography. And it's usually it has to do with weak ciphers. It's usually all as simply simple as that is down to that. So it tells you how to change it all. And et cetera, et cetera, like here's the algorithms you should use, et cetera. But it's, it's a good uh, article, and I highly recommend reading it and trying it out. Maybe we'll cover each one of these in the future uh, uh, SSH session. Um, Tyler Manson uh, linked to this article, which actually looks really good. Um, we were talking about OpenBSD and FreeBSD. This guy came out uh, and wrote the security comparison between OpenBSD and FreeBSD. And, uh, and it goes into detail. It goes into stack protection, like canaries, ASLR, et cetera, et cetera, uh, write execution on the memory segments, and so on. And uh, gives you some detail, even with like the, the, the actual system calls that they're making or the functions, et cetera. So if you're interested in that, I highly recommend reading this. I haven't got a chance to read all, all the way through it yet, but little pieces here and there. But it's actually pretty detailed. So if you're interested, and here's a little graph. I was a little chart that actually shows that some of the difference where things are implemented and where things are not. And unfortunately, a FreeBSD is behind on a lot of things, such as uh, automatic stack layout or randomization. But uh, I think there was a patch for it. We get to apply it to the kernel yourself, for example. Um, but yes, if you're looking for a secure operating system, yes, use OpenBSD. But it's, it's a pain in the ass. I, was, I, I had been some OpenBSD machines in the past, uh, mostly Spiral, things with uh, PF. But um, that's what it's for. It's divided with security in mind, and but with that comes, it's very behind with modern tools. A lot of stuff you can't install in the operating system because it's very slow moving. So it's just something to be aware of. But uh, FreeBSD is a little different. There, it's a, it's a more general BSD operating system that takes the best of uh, all the world. Well, I shouldn't say all the world, but it, it allows you to. It has a large uh, user community and large port system. <coughs> OpenBSD does not, so it's harder to install the packages. You um, so there's that. Education Epoch, anybody got anything? Any cool uh, articles or programs or courses on the, for teaching Linux or anything? No, I didn't have anything. Wait, I think a bunch of, oh, no, never, that's Linux, never mind. Okay. Never mind. I was um, security stuff. So uh, proc period is the next section. This is where we talk about the proc file system, which is the kernel file. This is what the kernel use or creates that allows you to interact with the kernel for at the, at, in user space. So um, we can just talk, since we're in this, this VM with Kubernetes and I can type a bigger SSH, we can actually go and have a, a shell inside this virtual machine I just created. So I have my boot system that I brought up with bigger. I'll become root. And you can see that if you look at mount, you'll see the procs right here. The modern, all modern Linux distributions will mount to the proc file system. And if you go to proc, this is actually uh, an insight into the kernel. So every all these numbers on the left hand side is a process. And so uh, PID1, for example, is your index system. It's the first process on the system. And these are all directories, so you can go and get information about particular processes. And you can also query this is how you directly query the, the kernel. Um, one, one interesting thing about this actually is there's a lot of information instead of actually making calls or uh, you can actually directly read and write from these files to change system settings. Like even increase your uh, your screen brightness if you find the right proc file or something in there, or a kernel setting that you can turn ASL off, off for example, in the proc file system if you didn't want to have automatic stack with the organization on, et cetera, et cetera. But there's a lot of programs that actually read from these files. I wrote a, a tool called PPS, uh, uh, et cetera, uh, packets per second, but it's a, it's a network tool that actually reads from procfs, and what it does is it gets the latest kernel statistics on network traffic, and then it, it'll read it every second. And then tell you how many, what your bits per second are, and the percentage of loss based on your, the, the link um, speed, like gigabit, for example. So that's, that's actually pretty cool. And uh, so, so that's, yeah, that's ProcFS. We can show you an example. Like uh, one, one, one is um, load average. 
This is actually what tools like Uptime and Top use to actually get the load information from the kernel. So we can actually test that. We can do S trace. We, we type Uptime. I was going to grab grip for a load average. You can see that this actual program. Oh, this writes to STD out of Or STD, I'm sorry. There it is. So you can see it whatever this this call that was made actually open proc load average. You can see the top does as well, and a number of, of other tools. So you can actually see that they programmers will actually take advantage of this, this kernel facility. And um, so that's one. Another thing is I think on the LPIC one test, uh, the Linux Professional Institute certification level one, they had a question on there about the proc FS, and they asked how do you get uh, what is the file inside the proc FS that actually tells you the kernel information, which is probably what you name reads from. And it was com uh, cat command line. This actually has, uh, oh, actually, that, that's, the, uh, that's the options you actually pass to the kernel. And that was, actually, that was the question. So you can see when the kernel was booted, it passed uh, the VM Linux image, uh, the UUID for the root file system, and these, these particular values for the console. So that's one way to see how the kernel was boot, booted. And that's actually really useful if you want to see what your current core was doing. Uh, in case a certain module will not load or something like that. So it's, it's, highly, it's, it's, a, it's a really cool place to play around with. Um, and of course, every PID, every process, uh, for example, my bash process 25656 actually has a, a number, you can see it right here, in the current in the proc file system right there. And I can do cat that, and you can see all the, all the files that are in that directory. And you can be like, oh, maps actually has the memory layout of that particular process from the stack to the heap. You can actually see where things start and stop. Um, what else happens is there's, there's another interesting one. Proc ENV is a cool one because as an admin, you'll find, or uh, even in security, you'll find a lot of cases where you want to see uh, how variables are set so that it determines how a program actually reacts based on those variables. And you don't know how it was started, so you can actually query the PID number and then e and VIRON for the environment and actually see the, the values that were passed or that were set when the program was ran, which is really useful. So uh, that's just a, a quick intro to that. Um, so in, the, in this example, so we already talked about the load average one. Uh, this one is how you can use ProcFS to detect uh, whether your hardware or your, your processor is using Intel uh, virtual machine extensions like the VT chipset. And we'll actually have to have a machine that um, has that to, for, for it to work, but this is a VM that I don't have it passed through, but you can see that nothing is returned. But proc CPU info actually has information on your CPU. So this is one way you can get it. It tells you uh, for, for each core, there's, a, there's, a one, there's only one core in the system, so it's just this one, uh, one um, group. But you can see the genuine Intel is a core i5 at this particular frequency, et cetera. And the flag is what we're actually looking for. There'll be a particular flag if the BT chipset is enabled, whether it's uh, AMD or Intel. And so we're actually looking for BMX for Intel and SVM for AMD. And uh, yeah, I missed it. So you can actually see for every processor in this one, we had a match on the line. And um, in this case, uh, 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 Gref is already met. Anytime it matches on the line, the entire line is highlighted. So you can all, we just really need to see that. So we can add, let's do this again. Let's add dash O though. And that will just match that particular part. Is that, uh, oh, it's because, never mind. That's because we're doing a, a beginning of line match. That's right. But you can see that these proc, these, these are cores, each one, so we have um, NPROC is eight. So it's eight cores in the system, so we can, and we have eight. You can see we just counted those number of lines. So let's just go to last proc CPU info, and we're going to look for VMX, and there's the match right there. So it just basically says that this particular core, core zero, has a VMX. This next one is core one processor, and you can see that has it all the way down. So that's one way to tell if, you, if your machine, without having to look in the BIOS, of having to look it up online, whether it supports the kernel uh, VM extensions or the, uh, the hardware extensions. Oops. Okay, and then uh, that takes it for um, proc period, SSH section. So, the fact if you want to transfer files, Wayland and I had this experience the other day. I was at my house and it was slow. Um, the fastest way to transfer a file at SSH is to use the one with the weakest crypto. And that's the ARC4 cipher, or RC4. So you can pass the dash O cipher equals ARC4 option, 
to copy a file with that. You should also use, for copying a file and it's large, you should also use compression if the network link is slow. That way the host actually takes care of the compression. And then if, in the case where the network link is slow, that's okay because you're sending less data because it's compressed. Um, but if the host is slow, then it probably won't help you much. We probably I, don't want to do this over multiple networks. So. Yeah. I mean, the NSA is completely broken, I see for it, so. It, it depends. What do you mean by that? I mean, it's weak it's encryption, so yeah. I mean, this is fine if you oh. speed things up on like a local area right. network. That, yeah. Oh, right. Like, no, so uh, let me amend this and say this is this is for cases where you, it's the data does not need to be need to be confidential. Yeah. So, so like, in this case, I was already connected to the VPN. So you don't need extra encryption, right? Yeah. Right. Like if you're talking like an ISO image or something of a bunch, you know, something that's big that you just want to get to another machine, it makes sense to do that. Yeah, our core is an encryption scheme. Uh, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like this, <laughs> this is not appropriate for every situation. <laughs> that is correct. And then with SSH, you have different levels of compression. And actually, just uses gzip compression. So we can do um, SSH, um, config, compression. And you can say whether to use compression yes or no, and the compression level, and you can see that nine is the best compression. That is, it's the slowest to actually produce, but it is the best of them. And it uses the same the same compression uh, algorithm that gzip does. You can set these in your files, or you can set it on the SS command line with the dash O option, and compression equals whatever. Does anybody have anything to add? By the way, does anyone want to talk about anything? I'm just kind of going. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I am curious. So. What's the difference between mounting it, uh, like with uh, SSHFS, uh, versus using MetaList to uh, use SFTP? Well, uh, SSHFS uses the fuse file system, right? Yes. Uh, so, I mean, it's just two different ways. Um, in, I mean, have you, have you used both of them? Uh, I have. Uh, back when I had Ubuntu, I used MetaList because it's built in. Now that I'm on Gen2, I mount it as a fuse directory. But I'm curious if it has any real performance differences. I do not know. I've never tested that. That'd be something uh, that'd be worth looking into. There'd probably be a paper in that. Yeah, could be. Or if it has an article online. Yeah, if you if you, were, if you care to look that up and see if anybody has it, if you want to. Uh, it's up to you, though. I'd be interested in seeing it, too. But I would expect that uh, SSHFS to be slower because it also has to work with the fuse driver. It just seems like there'd be more operations. All right. That's just a guess, though. And, and are the flags for the SSH, uh, uh, are the flags for SSHFS like the same as if you were doing SSH? Um, I haven't used SSHFS in a long time, so there are flags for it. Do I have them sold here? Oh, I do have it. Let's check. Yes, they have the mount options dash O. Um, now those won't be the same. Ports the same as an SSH. Um, let's say a lot will be different actually. Oh, wait, execute, okay, it's execute command instead of SSH. Um, let's, look, let's look for compression, for example, or compress. No, there's nothing matching for that. Oh, there is. So there is one. So dash C, that's one we can turn on compression. Uh, what was the other one? Uh, level, maybe? Oh, they didn't have compression level. It's a GZIP. No, oh, I don't see anything. So it actually, it actually looks like they're very different in terms of options. Can you do ciphers? Um, let's do alg or algorithm. Oh. oh. Yeah, so it doesn't look like there's anything unless they use a different word for it. Okay, well, that shows a huge difference between the two then. So SFT people have all those options too, So, but SSHFS does not, it looks like. All right. Um, so uh, this is cool. And make temp. This is a portable way. Well, I think portable except OS 10. Um, <laughs> yeah, it just works. You can you can laugh you yeah. can laugh on that one, Shane. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, to create uh, temporary uh, uh, temp directories. So it actually just returns a temp of a temp directory. So if you make temp here, oh wait, uh, yeah, this one. Let's just do it on the Linux. And it had to create a temp directory right there. And you can use this in your scripts. 
if you want to have temporary places to place your files, and a lot of programs will call this because it's a good way, to, it's a smart way to do it. One, one, it's almost completely portable across the like operating systems. And it gives a unique directory where you can copy files to a temp directory. So you don't have to interfere with anything else there. So we can actually see that that was the result. And um, we can actually go to that directory. So TMP. Okay, so <laughs> there it is. So it's a way it's a way to do things like that. So um, you use it in your scripts to create to create a directory and uh, do stuff with it. So pretty nice. Pretty neat. Uh, I see this with scripts that people write. Uh, about shell space, uh, suspend. So this is a way to suspend your shell. And so you know how you can suspend a program with job control, right? FG, BG, sent to the background, like for example, um, yes, put it in the background, right? I can still type command. You can't really see it because it's going so fast, but that foreground and quit it out. So we're using uh, F, let's just do a better example than that. Let's do uh, top. It okay, tops in the background right now. And uh, if I'm bring it to the foreground, ooh, it looks like there's a TTY issue with that. Uh, help me out here. What's something else? Um, like some, something that just huh? or something? What'd you say? G edit? Oh, uh, I don't have a GUI on this one. Or that, sublime or something? Don't have that. Pops up a window? No. Wireshark? Wireshark? Why is it so complicated? TCP not TCP not work. That's a good idea. Though. I don't have TCP on this one, but this will or type T shark on this one, but this will work. So we're listening on this interface. All right. So now it's actually still printing, but I still control the terminal, right? So I can send the clear signal and it actually clears the terminal. Type FG, it's back, right? Now I have control, and if it's clear, it's, it's coming to the or sending that to the process itself of the shell. Um, so that's why you can do job control, FG and BG. And um, so the ampersand at the end is how you send it to the background right away, right? So you can actually do that with the shell. You can actually send that. So this will not work right away. I thought the ampersand just like ran it in a separate process or something from the shell. Uh, no. it's, it's, we can look at the technical definition. Let's, or let's go see what I think you're thinking of exec, which is kind of the opposite of that. Yeah, no? yeah that replaces the process. Yeah. Um, let's see if they got the bashing and pitch. Um, what would that be called? Um, I might look for background. Yeah, so uh, it does. Okay, so um, we're. You're right, and I'm right. It's called the background. The more technical definition, it's ran in a subshell. So another process is spawned. Oh, so. Okay, cool. Thanks for bringing that up. Actually, I didn't think about that. Um, well, that's interesting. And then, okay, so suspend. So we actually cannot do this with a login shell. Um, so what we're going to have to do, we can do, I think we can do this and then suspend it because this is no longer a login shell. Because uh, we can go bash without having the dash dash login option, which is what the system does when you log in. So, so in this case, <coughs> we're able to suspend that particular process, and we can actually bring it back, right? So echo s or what is it? Uh, s s l s h l b l. Thank you. On oh, the shell level. All right, so we're in level two now. Suspend it. Echo s h l b l. We're now in level one. Zoom back and boom, we're both two. So that's one way to do that. But we can actually suspend the process uh, with the login shell process with the dash V option. It forces it. And now it's actually, wait, am I still level? No, I'm not. So it looks like it actually put another, oh, actually dropped me back down to the previous shell before I used sudo dash I, which actually invokes an interactive shell. So I'm there previously as I was. So that, that's really interesting. And I, um, now back as root. So that's kind of cool. So instead of having to maybe, Exit out and lose your current session, right? With the history and writing out the history and all that. What, hap what happens when you exit the bash shell, for instance, you can actually suspend it and drop back down to the previous shell. So that's that, that could be useful, you know what I mean? Um, I can, the only example I can think of is for history, though, right, at this particular moment, because when you exit the shell, it actually writes out uh, the hit depend stuff. But if you want to keep that and not write out that particular point in time, you can use a suspend. So. More is there a way to Linux use a Docker container in that? Is there a way to use Docker container with that? Like, huh. push the Docker container like to the. What do you mean background? exactly? Like, uh, push it to the a background. Doc, like, get a shell from a Docker container and then jump out of it. Yeah, like leave it running, but like without, you know, can, I know you can do Control P, Control Q, or whatever to like 
Quick oh, bite, Lee. I don't know. If, I don't think Fine. that'll work, but we can try it. Let's try it. Fuck it. Um, let's go to. Let's go to. Do a live. Do a live. Right. It's a big budget show. We do what we want. Oh. Speaking of which, uh, I was trying to. I was going to try to mention this earlier, but the ACM open house is Thursday at seven. Even though you guys already found the best SIG on campus, you should come and get free food. <laughs> Help represent. So you find out about the other best group, which is right before this one in the same place. Yeah. Yeah, if you're interested in intrusion detection, malware analysis, and security defense, we have a pretty cool meeting before that. We have a lot of industry speakers come, come and talk. So. Famous people. Yeah, we just have one that wrote. Where's that? That book right there next to Devin, the Applied Network Security Monitoring book. Like the author of that wrote. Do the both authors? Both speak. authors of that just gave us like a basic overview of like this is what flow analysis is, and these are the tools that you use, and here's how they work. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. You say pretty basic? I said pretty amazing. Oh, okay. Amusing? No, amazing. Good gotcha. job. Loved it. Yeah, that was pretty ten cool. out of ten. Would fuck again. <laughs> Oops. All right, so Docker run. All right, let's try this. I doubt this is gonna work because I I'm, I know I'm sure that it's not as, as simple. We don't even have. Okay, so suspend. We'll find out. What does it say? Oh, uh, yeah. Just drop me back down. <coughs> That's interesting. What what level of shell was I at prior? Um, and you can go control P, control Q, I think will get you to actually like leave this running and step back out of it. Control P, control Q? Yeah. Nice, I actually didn't know that. Um, cool. So at that point, let's go back into it. So what do you have to do to do that? Like if you have a controller running and it's got, you know, if you've got bash running in a container, if you hit control P, I think, and then control Q, yeah. All right, so that doesn't kill it, it just, it just get you get out of it and it's still running. And right. so you can then attach it to it again and get right back where you were. So in this particular case, it does not drop us back out. You can see that we're at shell level one. We type to span it, and then we echo again. We're still at shell level one. So in this case, it does not work. Uh, what happens if I pass the dash F option, though? Yeah. So what I suspect is happening is that um, init is just spawning a new shell potentially ready for us because um, the Docker system is a little weird because it's not completely the same as um, – the way links is usually do. That's just a guess, though. You could test that with dollar dollar. Good idea. Funny how they call. Uh, well, I guess that's right. Boss is one. Yeah. Exactly right. So that's I guess that's right, isn't it? Uh, suspend. Dollar dollar. Yeah, we're still one. So that's exactly why. And it spawns that new process for you. What's dollar dollar? It's the PID of the. Program. This is the best way to test shit. What? It's the PID of the, of the shell. Okay, so uh, that's that. So another one is group command. So this, I actually, I'm a little embarrassed. I've only recently uh, known how to do this. Um, so I write a lot of shell scripts, and uh, it's been a pain in the ass. Sometimes I like to do one-liners. And when you don't have a way to group the shell command, it's not like talking about subshells. I don't actually want to send all the commands executed to another shell, uh, which is a, a subprocess sub of the particular shell that you're currently in. It's nice to be able just to group them. I couldn't find a way to do that. This is how you use the curly braces, and you can actually group commands in this particular way. And let's see if we can give an example if I can come up off the top of my head. Um, so we're going to do true, which just exit zero, essentially. Uh, so true and, and echo. Yes, or or. Uh, let's do echo made it here. And, and LS. And you can see what actually happened here is not what I wanted to happen. I, it actually executed true, what rank, what returned true. So then the ampersand, uh, or these, this, this one is a, a, an and operator. So then it executes echo yes. And so you see the printed, but then it also happens, um, it actually, we want, to, we want to be do these things or do these things if one of these things fails. But what actually happens is it does these things, skips this one, it executes this one. So in a lot of shell scripts, it makes it's a pain in the ass to actually have to group this in different, or to use subshells, which I always use, use before. But that's not a really efficient way because it spawns a new, pro, a new shell process and runs those commands and exits. But in this particular case, you can actually just use groupings. So we do this. 
We do this, and we execute the semicolon. And now that actually did what I wanted. It executed the first two commands, and then that's it. It didn't evaluate the other ones. So do the, doing the reverse, false, this actually returns one, so it, it, it will fail, and then it will go to the or, because the and did not uh, match. So you can see it's, this failed, because it returned one, so this one didn't get executed, and then it immediately went to the or section, and what it executed made it here, right? And then uh, what actually happened was that it also executed ls, which in this particular case is fine. We want, we want that. But so but in, the, in the former case, it didn't do we want it, right? So that, that's kind of the difference here. So that's a little uh, a fun little way. I'm actually, I think I have a few examples of using the scripts to make things a little bit neater. Um, Why do you need the semicolon? If that's required, I'll just show you. It's just, it, you get a syntax on there otherwise. So, so I think bash treats the closed semicolon as like a separate command. Yeah, that's right. Um, I thought there was a, uh, See, it still wants more input, so I don't actually get a syntax error, but um, it, it, uh, it wants more information. So, yeah. So if you actually didn't use the and, what you'd actually have to do is made it here, this, and then you wanted to do um, ls. You have to use two semicolons if you do not want to make, do a some sort of uh, uh, operator that will do, yeah, the, the and. You can do um, that as well. And you can see here, you got both of them still. So that's one way to do it. And that is actually very useful. So I highly recommend uh, if you write scripts and you don't need to do the huge long if clauses, right? If then else, you can do little things like this just with the with the or and the and and. So it's really, it's really helpful. Um, that'll make you a better shell programmer. Um, so let's do let me add straight away. Let's do it. Let's see here. Not exactly what I wanted. I want to mesh on the same line, so let's do. Mm -hmm. Do something better than that. Let's do RSH. Really? I wonder why that didn't oh. Anyways, uh, I was just trying to find a good yeah, that matches. I don't know why they didn't do that. Uh, let's see here. I was trying to give an example of what, what I've used to do that. Oh, here's one right here. GR security. So this is I run a Vega configuration to provision the GR security patches to the Linux kernel, which uh, improve overall security um, by providing like discretionary access control. And improvements in ASL law or more uh, more stack protections, for example. And that's actually ugly. Well, let's do this. Okay. So we want to look for that line that I had with the curly braces. You can see it right here. So what we're doing is we're making we're running make install to install the Linux kernel. And then what we're doing is we're running this function after if the Linux kernel returns the install command returns zero, so it actually correctly installed. Then what will actually happen to the grouping? If that does not happen, it will die, and then it will exit out and print this, this error message: "Failed to install new kernel," which is just a shell function I wrote. <laughs> Excuse me. So like, this is an example of how I do that that complete that grouping without having to do a bunch of tests for different uh, exit codes and such. So it's just an easier way to do it. I can fit it all in one line. There's an example of that. All right. Um. Vim vicinity. By the way, does anybody have anything to talk about? Anything at all? Kind of. Okay, pretty good. What's up? Um, I just found out about this thing today called script and script replay. Have you heard of that? Yes. Yeah. I never knew about that. Yeah. So um, that, that's cool. Uh, so yeah, we should we should. You want to demo that? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you want to use my machine or you want to use yours? Uh, well, mine's a phone right now. Yeah, use mine. It's got script on there. So okay. Script replay. Which version? Do you have the? Well, I'll just find out. It's gonna be with the old one with. Uh, SD. Uh, like a new version. Okay. So just a little um, why he's getting ready for that. Uh, I actually use this for when I'm consulting 
and, I, and my client wants to know a record of all the commands I typed and all the output, standard out and standard error, this is exactly what it does. It records the entire terminal session to a file. <laughs> hmm. And if memory serves, it also has a usage when you're like exporting and then going to elevated privileges or switching users or something. This program? Script? Yeah, it actually launches a new shell. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Could you use it for like a honeypot or something? Yeah, you could. Yeah, I've actually tried to do that, yeah. Uh, but it, was, it wasn't it was for a honeypot, but I tried to do it on my machines to make my compromise and logged in. The script was running. It was kind of hackish, but if someone wasn't smart enough to actually know that, they wouldn't know. Sorry, go ahead. Okay, uh, so the program uh, script is a way you can sort of um, record like a, a uh, shell session and play it back later, uh, which is pretty cool. So like, um, the, I saw it being used as a uh, as an alternative to like a screen recording uh, that takes up a lot less file size and it's pretty cool. So um, there's a utility called Script, and uh, it, you can see at the top it says make a TypeScript of a terminal session. And uh, TypeScript is what they call uh, a file that will be generated of all the of all the um, input and output that you create when you're working. And then it saves that as a file, and then you can play it back later. And then it also saves a time file, which records the um, the time between all your keystrokes, so you can play it back and have it, you know, like how you how you typed it. So um, basically, a better way. Uh, that to just show you. So, um, I think the way to do it on this version, uh, most uh, most Linux distributions will come with uh, GNU script, which is uh, an easier to use version, in my opinion. Okay, um, do you want to use that instead? I'm sorry. That's fine. Oh, I got it open right now. Okay. Uh, just do it there. Okay. So, uh, let's see. so now he's in my Linux bigger view. Yeah, okay. So, um, you can see here the uh, the dash T option uh, will specify will specify a timing file. Uh, on the on the old version of script, it outputs to the standard error, so you have to just redirect that to a file. Um, so if we do script dash T, and we'll call that the file time, and uh, specify the TypeScript file. Let's call it TypeScript. And so now it's starting to record. So um, Um, you can you can even open like a um, you know a terminal editor or anything like that. Uh, it'll still record everything. And then when you're done, you can just exit out of the shell, and it says script done, and the file is TypeScript. And you can see here uh, we have a time file and a TypeScript file. And if we look at the TypeScript file. Um, you can see there's a bunch of escape sequences which were from the, the terminal uh, moving cursors and drawing stuff in different uh, escape sequences. And then if we look at the time file, but you can see also in there is the uh, is the actual content of um, what we were working on. You can see here's the hello and all that. And then if we look at the time file, um, these are uh, I guess these are second values in seconds of uh, time between keystrokes. But basically, this file, uh, these two files can be read at the same time by a, um, by a program called Script Replay, and uh, that will take those two files as arguments, and it will play it back just how you recorded it. Which is pretty cool, so. Pretty sweet. And of course, there's all this dead space because I was talking. And uh, that's pretty much it. <laughs> yeah, it's, just, it's a really sweet program. I think there's a few other options. I, I just found out about this today, though. Um, I know there's an option for um, it limits the time between uh, huh. I guess this version doesn't have it but 
at home when I was looking at the manual page, there is a there is a option to uh, suppress any like long uh, intervals. Like for example, that time when I was like talking for six seconds at a time, you could suppress that to a shorter time. Um, and this one's pretty cool, the dash D divisor. You can uh, you can specify a multiplier uh, for how fast the uh, how fast the recording will play. Get a demo of that. So like let's say we want to play it at three times. And there's me typing faster than I can ever type. <laughs> and yeah, that's pretty much it. So a few things. You don't have to actually type a TypeScript at the end. You know, you use a TypeScript file by default. Right. So you can set your own file name if you want. So if you want to type like, oh, John Session, you will write it to that. Yeah. Um, another thing is, it's really useful if you're making a new system and you mess something up, it's helpful to have a log of everything you typed and the output of all of it. So in that case, a lot of times I'll just be in a new, a new system, I'll type script and I'll have a log of everything I type after. So I can look back if I screw something up or I want to know what I did prior to that. Is there a way to like view a cleaned up version of the log file without all the tons of key presses? Uh, you can use dash less dash r. You still have the file there? No. Oh, whoops, that's right. Uh, okay, hold on. <laughs> if it's up to you, yeah, he's making one real quick. One, two. Dash R, you said? Yeah. Oh. Yep. Oh. So that, uh, go look at the list, man page for less and do dash R, because I can't remember, it's, it has something to do with the terminal codes. It tries to interpret them or something. Everything fancy, right, Jeff? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it causes raw control characters to be used by, so you actually won't see, you won't see them. Oh, and there's also uh, new. I think if you can, it'll do it too. There you go. Yeah, cat by default does not show escape sequences without passing like the um, dash, uh, what's it? Mm. Or something. Do, do a script with Vim. There you go. See. Well, you got the, uh, yeah, do a script with Vim though. Okay. And then drug cat. I think, I think it'll show something. I can't remember. Uh, so less dash R, or just yeah, just dash R. Okay. And, okay. Okay, that's freaking out. And then do cat, cat, just cat that phone too. Oh, okay. So that, right, you're right. Yeah. Oh, there were some, but it didn't do. Yeah. Um, if you modify the content of the the file is saved, can you still replay? Of the mod file? Uh, which one, the time file or the type script? Or either one. Like, let's say someone just want to mess around with it. And yeah, you should be able to do that. So okay. let's see. Uh, of course, this is going to be garbage. Um, I'd imagine it works because I always have the same number of key press timing events as you had stuff in your script file. Yeah. And I imagine it, it probably parses it, you know, from the top down. So even if the end doesn't work, it probably would work for the beginning. It's like if I were to add something here. And then maybe let's. What's the second column with the keystrokes? No. What I want to do, I never got around to it, but I want to run a program with a use script. Yeah. To actually, if you're, if you're two people in the same machine, 
connected terminals and instead of connecting the terminals, they'll use script to actually replay it off. I guess you can replay it on their terminal if right. you have permissions to write to it. Yeah. And you can actually use it as like a training thing. Oh, yeah. So follow me, follow along. That would be well, cool. Okay, as I'm typing. You know. Yeah. And you could, uh, you could couple that with screen or Tmux or something and just put it like in the tab or something. Yeah, you could do that too. Yeah. I'll have to look at that later. Yeah. Cool stuff. Never knew about that. And I'm I think guessing sure. there is no limitation on time or capacity. How about the drive? Yeah, I would think it'd be dip fossil some disk, you know, one of the two. Okay. I don't know. I've never had a huge script file though, so Thank you. Yep. Can't speak for new stuff like system C with binary outputs. Those are confusing. Oh, God. Oh, God. Okay, now we've got um, the Vim vicinity app. And this is where uh, we talk about Vim. So, just for those that have never been to Lug before, uh, the idea here is you have these little, these little sections to pack you full of of all kinds of new information on all these tools so that if you stuck with log or you went to a lot of meetings, you probably know more about the command line than most links people you would meet if you just follow along with this stuff. So that's it's kind of just introducing to new new command line options, new uh, new ideas, et cetera, et cetera, for all these common programs. That's kind of how we, we do our sections. So um, hopefully you think it's information packed. So. And then we do have talks. So um, I'm going a little slow, so let's read some of this up. Um, Vim vicinity. Uh, so as we're talking about Vim, let's go to my, my Vim configuration here. Just do that there. Just do this thing. Right. Um, so we have a few modes to do uh, indentation. We talked about indentation in visual mode tonight. We'll talk about indentation in mobile mode. Um, we did that a prior being you know, a visual mode, which is essentially, um, so I want to do this, highlight a bunch of lines, and then I want to move them over, right, block, move them back. So um, using the uh, V the V key to enter visual mode, highlighting it with the arrow keys, or you would use uh, J, K, L, semicolon, which is what I use. And you can move it around after you use the repeat command stuff. So but we'll talk about it in uh, norm, normal mode. So if you do uh, greater than greater than sign twice, it actually moves it over. And you can use the repeat key to period to move it over multiple times and U to move it back. So it's a very simple way to do this. Um, also, you can do uh, three. So you can specify a number of how many lines you want to move. So I want to do five lines. And then I'm pressing the greater than greater than sign twice. No, this is normal mode. Uh, so this is just when you're uh, you're moving around, right? So how are you? So hit escape in your normal mode, and then just do uh, this type this way, like that the greater than like just like that twice, yeah. and you should see your line the line you're on move to, is indented. You see that? Oh, cool. So now do it with four type just type of number. So I'm gonna do four and then do the same thing, the that the greater than greater than and hit period to move it multiple times, but just repeat the last command. So that's that. That's a cool one. And then we have um, this is moving a paragraph. Thank you. Paragraph. And I don't know if I'll have to match that. I can't actually remember. I'm gonna go to the I'll go to the script that doesn't work here. Uh, yeah, I'm going to need a, oh wait, that's actually, let's see here. Yep, so I did that, but it wasn't a paragraph. So let's go to a shell script. And it's got a bunch of lines you can do. Uh, you can see that moved the paragraph right there, right? So I'm using this command right now, this one right here. And you can do that maps to go forward and backwards. You want to do the other direction though. You want to do the greater than sign again to go forward, right? So greater than sign and then the right curly brace, and then I'll move a paragraph worth of information over. And you can use the repeat commands there too. So we'll do it here. And so you can move it. See, so Vim tries to figure out what what is a paragraph and does it by the number of lines that are together, right? 
you don't have to count every time. Then we have this one, and uh, uh, Lucian, you know that on the top of your head. Is that just the... Uh, I think that's... Uh, wait, hold on. Uh, I'm an idiot. That's what I meant. So I'm using the... I'm sorry. I'm going to go ahead. I got it now. Uh, so this is the mod. Okay, so we're actually... Help. Operators. I think that's what I'm looking for. Where going that you're typing yeah, so we're actually, you can actually use a lot of these. So in this case, we're using, um, we don't even see curly brace, curly brace, where yet? Oh, here it is. So we're actually moving that. Here we're going to use parentheses. So what we're going to do is on a function, it can be any programming language where the, it begins and ends with the curly brace, you can do that, that same thing and move the entire block of code for that, for that entire function back and forth. And let's try to find one with a... This one right here, this one's got the uh, parentheses, the same thing here. So that one looks, let's try it here. And that moves the whole thing. So uh, what happens if we did it on this? Let's do this. Try it that way. And we'll do, nope, I did multiple lines here. So that one doesn't work on that though. It's like I don't know what the definition of that is. But so that's the quick way that you can use it. But I highly recommend visual mode is the best way though, because if I want to do, I can select it right here. I just type B and then move around and move. Boom, 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 boom. Real simple. But the curly brace one is is excellent if you just want to move this function. So one, one last time, I want to move this function. I'll type two characters. Ready? Go. And now I have the whole function moved. All right. So next is. Um, Indentation in insert mode. This is one that I've never used before until recently. So if you're actually typing your insert mode, so I'm, I'm going to be in right now, so I'm typing some text, you can actually move that. Or notice my cursor is at the end of the line, right? And control D to go back. And actually, I've not usually used this yet, but I'm going to try to. So that way you don't actually have to keep, you don't have to type. If you messed up and you're not where you want to be, you don't have to press escape and then move it. You can actually do it all in one, in one, in the same mode. So in insert mode, whoops. Um, you just type, type your text, and this control T, and I'll move it over. Control D to go back. So that's a really nice one. That concludes Vim vicinity. Um, oh, no, I'm sorry, I got color schemes. So last one. This is really nice, easy to do. Uh, so go into uh, your command mode. So press the, press the colon key, right? And type color scheme. And it, a lot of times it'll be able to, you can go and tab it out. Sorry, lowercase. Damn it. Hit it, hit it. There we go. So now, color, God damn. Sorry, my bad. All right, so there we go. Now, color scheme, and now you can cycle through the number of colors for your terminal. So you can just hit tab. And I want to change this to uh, desert. Well, you can do shift, shift tab to go backwards. And then now it changes my, my BIM color scheme to the desert color. And again, you can just tab through. Uh, if you want to match on something, just want to start with the T, just match on that, 40. Look at that, looks, looks all right, not bad. Not a bad color scheme. And then uh, you can go back, I'll go back to my default and just polarize. So again, color scheme, and then just tab to what the ones you want. So it's a nice way to do it. Um, Devin, we do, uh, do, do you want to be, how long do you want to do it last? Or, well? It's actually really short, okay. so. Yeah, you want to be our dessert? <laughs> Your machine? Yeah. You have no, sir. What is it? I win. What? Creepy GoPro. <laughs> it would be creepy if I sent it to one of these guys who I don't really know. <laughs> but Devin. Or if you want to go on the Zoom call, you can do that. Yeah. Uh, that's what I'm saying. You, you, can, you can just, uh, I can just yeah, suggest that. It's not a free software. No. Yeah. That way we have, we can actually refer back to you, sir. Like, I know this is a free right. do you ever visit the program VRMS? Like, uh, it stands for virtual arm. And so it's for induction on the non free packages installed. Is it really? Yeah. Ah, that's all. And it, how about spot? The RMS. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it does installing this. And 
Presumably someone has a cow file for Maybe we, we get Mad Dog to come talk. Leland? Uh, Probably get Mad Dog to come talk. If he doesn't die by then. Remember Mad Dog? Sleep in. What? Did he consult it on the Matrix movie? He did? Mad Dog? He's the one that put in the bit about uh, Trinity exploiting the SSHD1 vulnerability to bring down the power grid to save Neo. <laughs> That's good. He, like, he wrote that for the movie. Nice. Well, he said it's feasible. Yeah. As opposed to, I'm going to write a GUI interface using Visual Basic. Or an IP address. Right. <laughs> See if I can track an IP address. Or Emacs. It's not great. <laughs> All right, so uh, this is today I'm doing bit sets in C, which are actually a really neat way to uh, do certain calculations with sets and take advantage of hardware level parallelism because uh, they all involve bitwise operations, which are extremely fast. So uh, the basic idea behind this is like you have some unit that's of course only useful for finite you know, calculations. You have some universal set of objects and you want to do operations on subsets of it. You want to take units of things. You want to take intersections. You want to see whether one thing is a subset of another. You want to see whether certain uh, objects are in certain sets, you know, or whatever. So, uh, the, so the basic idea is you, you have your universal set. You impose some arbitrary ordering on it, and then so what the zeroth element, for example, and then you so you have your words, for example, 32-bit ints on 32-bit machines, 64-bit ints on 64-bit machines, whatever. And in principle, you can extend this to a pretty large number of elements by just having an array of words instead of a single one. But you know, for this, just to keep it simple, I'm only doing one word. So depending on the size of your machine, you could have universal set of 60 with 32 or 64 elements. But yeah, so the idea is in each position, in each bit, so each each word is considered as a set and the zero, the zero in a certain position means that, that particular element is not a member of that set and a one means that it is a member. So right away you can see that there are two to the n possible different subsets because there are two to the n different binary strings and length then and then we can do all sorts of operations on them. So to create a new bit set, all we have to do is just return zero because all the bits are zero. To take the complement, it's just the bitwise complement. And then to get the cardinality, we have to calculate the Hamming weight of the string, which is the number of ones in it. And there are all sorts of algorithms to do this quickly. The naive way of testing each bit and adding up the cases for where it's one is really slow because of all the branching and stuff. And there are plenty of branchless algorithms to do this, which we could do, but that would take forever. So I kind of cheated. GCC, maybe other compilers have a built-in that actually uh, converts this in some cases to a single machine instruction. Some CPUs are capable of computing the Hamming weight in a single instruction. So uh, whatever is best for your particular machine, it'll do that. So you can just add up all of the ones and get the cardinality of the set right away. To take the union, it's just a bitwise or. To take the intersection, it's a bitwise and. To subtract one set from another, you just, you are taking the union with the complement of the second set. So you're saying all of the elements that are in A, but that are not in B. To take the symmetric difference of two sets, that is, all elements that are in one set but not both sets is just exclusive or. And you can toggle whether you can remove or add individual objects to a set. Uh, by if you want to add them, you just take the or with one shifted to the correct position uh, to remove them. You take the bitwise and with the complement of one. So this is all ones except for a zero in the particular position. You take a bitwise and. So that'll set the bit to zero. To check whether A is a subset of B, you uh, just, so this right, this is a logical implication. So this is saying A implies B, or in other words, for each bit, 
uh, membership in A implies membership in B. So in order for an A to be a subset of B, all of the bits have to be one, and which is the complement of zero. To test whether it's a member, you are all you have to do is just uh, take the bitwise and with the one in the appropriate position. And uh, I, I was inspired to do this because I was talking to Shane about one of his homework problems, and uh, this came up. I mean, we did the calculation mathematically, but I also wanted to write a program. Uh, it was involving a graph where the vertices were set, and we wanted to count how many edges were in the graph. And uh, the and the edge set followed certain rules. So uh, I took so uh, there were 64 different vertices. So for each vertex, I compared it to all of the other vertices. And uh, for each comparison, I essentially I did a subset calculation. And uh, if it satisfied certain properties, I added one to the number of edges, and when you sum it up over all the possible combinations, you get the final answer. And there's only a few lines of code for very complex calculation. So, yeah. This is just, and uh, I mean, this is a very nice method of doing this because obviously CPUs are designed to do all the calculations on the different bits in parallel. So you get extremely fast computations of these basic operations. So it's useful for all sorts of things. And yeah, that's it. Any questions? Does anyone know what's going on? No, I don't anyway. What's going on? So you have, I you guys don't know what a set is, right? Sure. There's the collection. Yeah, like a collection of objects. In this case, it doesn't really matter what they are. So you have like, yeah. So it's just like a, it's just like a bunch of objects that you put in a box, and the subset is you take out maybe some of the objects, but not all of them. It could be all of them. You could take out none. You just take out some objects, and that's the subset. And a, a union is when you mix two things together. An intersection is when you see what elements they have in common and all that stuff. So, uh, I just thought this was kind Sorry, Devin, I know what you're talking about. I just, when you asked that, I wasn't paying attention. Yeah. Screw bastard. Okay, I'm a member. Oh, I wish I understood it, but that sounds cool. Sorry about that. Step four is profit. Did I miss that part? Is there a restroom on this floor? Yeah, it's right there. Okay. The other side of the elevator. But I have a question. You use that built-in, right, Popcom? Yeah. Like, how does how is the processor able to do that? Do you know? In one machine. Executive or execution, whatever. However, however they design it, I mean, it's I, I don't know how that works on the circuit level. Yeah, because like if they can do it with one machine instruction, can we emulate that in the software? Probably in one, in one execution, so that so that regardless of the of the architecture, we can we can do that. I'm thinking, I mean, there are very fast algorithms to do it, but I think doing it in one cycle would require specialized hardware. Okay. But there are branchless and loopless algorithms to calculate that so that you don't mess up the pipeline or anything. Thank you, Devin. So how did you, your, the problem, the homework problem was a graph, and you have to shut it up here. Yeah. How, how was the, that graph presented to you? How did you get it? It was, so, okay, it was, uh, you had the set S containing one, two, and three. 
and the vertices mm -hmm. were okay. power set of S, cross power set of S. So you had 64 different ones, right? First, uh, vertices, okay. yeah. And the rule was there's a directed edge between A and B if the first component of A is a subset of the first component of B. Okay. And the question was to count the number of edges. So we did that mathematically, and then I also wrote a program to use these operations. Um, just yeah, that that out. So. Yeah. Okay. Are sets in regular like in ZC? Or is it in what? Were you showing C or C? Yeah, pretty pretty similar. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you can yeah, do the same thing in C. Yeah. Um, just start C. Okay. Yeah, you can do it anyway. I would say what separation. Mm -hmm. Okay, on to the small talks, and then we'll be done. Okay, so the first talk is just more Docker stuff. I gave a Docker talk on the back. Um, we're just going to talk about just some small, a few, like a handful, or not even a handful, like three things I thought were cool. And if I can remember them, I'll just read my notes down. But, uh, so one is. Then we use Docker exec. That's a new uh, Docker command. Okay, so we'll talk about that's an easy one to talk about then. So and that was released in 1.3 or 1. I think it's 1.3 or 1.4. Um, so we're on a host. This is one of my island systems. And let's see here. We have Docker help, and we can see that there is a new command called exec. So it, it, it basically it takes an existing container and allows you to attach to it and with the intention of running uh, some sort of command. So um, we can actually do, so we have, let's check the containers right here. So I have three containers right here. We have C Advisor, Ubuntu, and we have Islet. So we can go to any one of these. This is called the Islet container. So we actually need the container ID in this case, because it works on containers, not images. So we're going to docker exec, and we'll do the help for the options. You can see there's a few options here, hmm. interactive, um, TTY, and we want, if we want to have a shell, in, enter a shell in that container, uh, we would actually need to have a TTY allocated so we can do stuff. So uh, we'll do docker-it for interactive true, the container ID, and then what we'll do is uh, run the command. So I can do ls, but that's really not interactive. So I ran that, top, of course, return environment on set. Uh, I wonder if you can do this, or if you can turn over. VT uh, 100, for example. Uh, actually, you can do it. Well, you can't, you can't pass that. Actually, you can't pass that in on uh, Docker Exec, but you can really do the regular program. Yeah. Anyway, so we're going to just go ahead and do bash, though. So this is how you fix stuff. If there's a running container, say you have, an, like in our case, Islet server, and you need to fix something while it's running in a particular container, like if some user is in there doing something, you can attach to it in this particular way and work on it, find out what they're doing, make changes, et cetera. Or if you have a web application that's running in a container, you want to make a slight change, you want to get some logs off of it, et cetera, you don't have a better way to do it. You just run docker exec, interactive term, so the terminal, and then say which container ID to, to attach to, and then give it the command you run. So I'm bashed, and I'm actually in this container while it's running. So, um, okay, we don't have, let's try to like, export uh, term equals bt100, which is an old terminal, and see if that does the trick. So now we can actually run top and view stuff in the container live while it's running. So there's thousands of web uh, requests, HTTP requests this machine, for example. I could actually run this and see how it goes inside my container, see where it's getting as far as data processes, et cetera, et cetera. So that's just a small one. So that's a fairly new uh, Docker command that's very useful. Um, what else we got is, uh, so in the case where, have you ever known what a bind mount is in Docker? A what? A bind mount? It's just essentially a mount. They call it a bind mount. But yeah, mounting something from the host to the container. 
Um, so we can do buy mounts for not only directory, but you can do buy mounts for particular programs. Anything on the file system really is you can actually put dev null from the host inside the container. You can put your MySQL Unix socket from the host inside the container. You can do your X11 socket from the host inside the container. That allow it, that way you can actually use those commands inside the container and directly talk to the host. Um, so in our case, I use a bind mount to mount Docker inside a Docker container. So you, inside a Docker container, you can control Docker on the host. So it's a Docker in your Docker kind of thing. And um, you can actually see here, oh yeah, I don't know. You notice the trailer here. We'll go to this directory. I'll show you the commands I ran to actually do this. So, uh, uh, there it is. Okay, so we're actually, oh, let's let it. But that one does it too. Okay, so here's mine. I'm running a Docker run. My name is here's Islet. And here I'm specifying the bind mounts. This particular one is taking. The user bin Docker client from the host operating system, mounting it in the container, so that when you run Docker inside the container, it's actually communicating with Docker on the host. So you can be in a container and control Docker. And what you all have to do is because your, your Docker your Docker images and containers are stored in var lib Docker slash mount slash storage backend AUFS or device mapper, for instance and then the directory structures are down there. So to actually utilize that to create containers from within a container, you actually have to mount as well that particular file directory structure as read-write inside your container, and that's exactly what I do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty awesome. So here I mount bar and Yeah, so you can, wow, okay, that, that's good to know. You can like commit the container you're in from inside the container. <laughs> yeah, you, you can do that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it'll allow you to do that in a running container, but... Yeah, no, you can't. Oh, yeah, that's right. That, that's right. That, yeah. yeah, you commit running containers. That's right. I didn't think about that. Yeah, that'd be pretty sweet. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's fucking cool. <laughs> so also is, if you want to do firewall rules from inside the container, say you have a container that's a firewall, right? And it's intended to have some scripts to do some firewall management. You mount IP tables from the host system, you can then use that container to actually manage the firewall from the host system. So if it, it gets a bag and it can block it or something, it can apply the appropriate rule. So that's actually really cool. Um, but you always, you want to mount, either, like in this case, our mount is read only so that nobody can modify that. Because you know, if you modify it in the container, you also modify it on the host if you can write that binder. It's the same one, right? It's just mounted. So you always want to do those read only. And I also mount some of that stuff from the host. But Other examples are um, the question. Sorry. But when you're running it, running it with the privileges of the host, not the privileges of your container. Uh, no, it's actually the privileges of the container. So you have to make sure that your container is configured to have the appropriate privileges to do it on the host. So uh, in the case of Docker, you can do that. You just have to be root inside the host, or add your user to the Docker group inside the. Or, I'm sorry, root inside the container or add the user to the Docker group inside the container, and that will allow you to do it. Um, and there's a difference, between, depending on the type of stuff, if you have a, there's a, a privileged containers and unprivileged containers, depending on the software that you want to, want to run and how it's exposed, you may have to use dash dash privilege with the Docker daemon. I haven't had to do that, but for the most cases, it seems that IP tables, which is a root tool that you have to use to become root to actually apply rules, and same with the Docker binary, uh, besides the fact that you can become a, you can be part of the Docker group, you don't actually need to do that. I'm surprised because doesn't IP tables write stuff into the kernel? Yeah. So as long as you're root inside the container, in this case, uh, well, actually, I shouldn't say that because I actually haven't tested that. I just I'm just guessing that it works. I probably should have tested that before I committed this anyway, but I did. So <laughs> we'll we'll see because uh, this, this is a feature of the program I wrote that's not very. I don't know why that's used it, so I, I need to do more testing on it. But so it's there. I haven't tried it, but. Yeah. So what we can do is um, this is a hack from using Vagrant to do this. We can actually try it right now, though. Huh? You're saying like this is a Vagrant hack on Docker, but this is not no, a this, feature of Docker. Huh? This is not a feature of Docker that you. That, uh, that but you, you mean the privilege stuff? Well, no, like just being able to like manage. Docker from inside of the container. Yeah, it, it's not, it, it allows you to do it, but it's like it's, it's more like an abusive hack. thing. I don't think anybody's doing that. It's a bigger hack, right? No, it has nothing to do with bigger, but I would say it's a Docker hack, or an OS hack. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Because this is just a bit. This so is this just vagrant being... happens to be using those mouths. Yeah. Okay. Well, in this particular case, I'm not using vagrant at all. This is just an easy two B out. Oh, but I, I, you were in a bigger file. Oh, that was a different window. This one's actually a, a DC2. But yeah, in, in either case, just the VM, right? So it has, that's, 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 there's nothing to do with that. Um, but um, let's try it, though. Like, when you asked about the IP tables, so let's go to this, and we'll do docker exec, right? We'll use that command we talked about prior. Uh, damn it. Okay. And, oops, that's not what I wanted. Damn it. All right, so I'm in there. Now what we're going to do is we're going to run IP tables. Ah, looks so like I can't even run that. I need to bounce the libraries from the host in that particular case. So I probably should check that out. Let's try syscontrol. Syscontrol seems to have something, and this actually modifies the kernel as well. So uh, in this particular case, depending on the option, uh, we'll, we will set something. Uh, let's do A. Let's change, I don't know, dirty bytes, memory paging shit. So this will have to make a write to the kernel. So let's do syscontrol dash w equals one. And this uh, it looks like I cannot do that for this particular case. Um, will that happen for every one? And why does this say read only? Setting key. Let's try that from the host first, actually, because I've never even set this guy. Just to make sure it works. Uh, yep, it does there. So let's go back to the container and let's try a different one. But I think it's going to be that for everyone. Let's set the loopback MTU to, this is going to be required to be have root two. Let's set that to the, the MTU of an Ethernet uh, frame equals 1514. Yeah, so it looks like that doesn't that doesn't actually work either. So um, what we'll need to do, I think, is we'll need to run it as a, a privilege container, and then it should work. So um, this is right here is by default, privilege is false for your containers, and if you do is true, that gives your containers extended privileges. So that will allow you to, I assume, allow you to modify the host in that particular way. All right. But I can, I can, but in that container, as a, a normal standard user, I can in fact uh, work with Docker from the host. I've actually it tests it works. Like every time I, I log in with that, I use Docker like the run. I can create a new host on the actual host or on the, in the container on the host operator. Does it tell Docker to give you elevated privileges? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Docker. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. When, when, when you actually create the container. Um, if we're talking about elevated privileges, we're talking in terms of the container. So every container is default just to have no to have a, a limited set of permissions. And I'm saying if you have Docker inside your container, can you real time reset the privileges of that container so that you can then do other stuff? Good question. I don't know. Let's find out. So Docker run dash dash privilege equals true it. Uh, Bash. Oh, that's not the image I want to do Ubuntu. Ah, looks like I have I did run a privilege container and accepted it inside from a container. So a container with a, con a container right at this particular point. Now I don't know if it since it's ran from a container, I don't know if we'll actually have the ability. We don't even have IP tables on this one. Is this control? It's good. Let's try that. Uh, what I did it earlier. It's just control. <coughs> okay. Or let's just do that. And then, and this is probably going to give you the same thing, I imagine. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. Well, hold on. Yeah. I, I, I just modified the. Uh, well, no, I'm in, a, I'm in a container. In this particular case, I did not modify this because that's because I didn't uh, bind mount the the um, s R, the s control system control tool from the host. So I actually need to do that. Um, so we'll need to do dash v s spin. Let's get complicated. Uh, s spin system control. Just set this okay, so now that should be the system control from the host. 
And from there, are you proving the opposite though? I think. No. Just control W equals zero. And then ah. Let's change it to one and let's check the host operating systems kernel. All right, so now um, let's go ahead and open the one up. There you go. That. All right, and sudo dash i, sys control dash a, and we run a grep for no. commit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so here's what, here's what happens. I'm in a container, launched another container from within that container with the dash s privilege open, and by now the uh, spin sits control from the host operating system. I'm two containers deep. In that second container, I set sys control values for the, the memory paging system in there, and it did in fact modify it on the host yeah. uh, kernel. Oh. <laughs> this is so awesome. All right. So yeah, so you just need to pass pass or pass the dash dash privilege options. All right. Shane, you, you missed all that. That was awesome. Obviously, being a rude douche today. Who is? Me. Uh, and they reported. I'll put it up the mic. Uh, so next thing. So uh, the other thing I want to talk about real quick was the um, a few the, the, the file structure in Docker. So let's do um, actually yeah. So Okay, so let's put it over there. So if you want to find out what your back end is from Docker, um, repositories, it is this, it's the repositories dash, the actual storage back end driver. In this case, I'm using AUFS. You can do Docker info. So you can see that the storage driver is in fact AUFS right here. So um, this is how you're able to detect on the fly uh, by, by doing a, a, a file glob with the shell and uh, doing the data in there to find out what storage back you're using if you're not using the Docker info command. Because you don't have to spawn that process. But you don't need to respond to Docker and then run the info command, which is extra, especially if there's a, a blocking or a locking issue, which I've had before. There's a lot of containers running. It can be really slow just to get the output Docker command. So you can actually just read from the file system and just read from this repositories dash whatever the back end is. So if it's if the back end is, store, is device mapper, it'd be uh, var lib repositories dash device mapper. In this case, we're using AUFS. You can see you have a JSON uh, image or a JSON file here that has all kinds of information about your, your current Docker setup. So here, this is actually a file that, that refers to every image in Docker that you have. So you can see that I have my Google C Advisor one, my Islet one right here, and a few other ones. So this is how you're able to query the image. You can just parse these on the JSON tool and uh, get the uh, the image ID or get the um, the image name for your particular uh, Docker installation. Well, that's that kind of cool. Where's that stored? Where's that stored? But it does. Um, bar lib Docker uh, slash repositories. It's just a file, but the last part. Is you have to specify that uh, is the file name is repositories dash and their storage back end driver. So if you have Docker installed now, you're probably using AUFS or you're probably using Device Mapper. Yeah, Device Mapper. I, I so you, yeah, so then type Device Mapper at the end and cat that file, and you have that JSON data. Um, the other thing that's interesting with Docker is um, what else is that? Okay, it is. Uh, there's JSON data for all of the containers, and you can actually pull in information, the actual settings of the container. Of course, there's a, there's, the, you can, there's a library, you can import Docker and Python, for example, and query it that way. But you can do it from the shell, too, because all of these files. Uh, so this, this is the last example I'm going to give you for, for the Docker section. Uh, so we do Docker, or bin, or cron. I'm just looking at my, my, my scripts that I wrote, because I can't I don't remember all this by heart. But um, what should I use? Is it this one? Yeah, so var lib docker containers, config.json is the file. So you can go to var lib docker, right, containers, and there's uh, the containers, right here, the container, right, the hash, all the way down, and you can see there's entire file systems, or that's not the file system, that's actually the container information. And you can see there's a JSON file, so let's go to one of the containers, let's go to ACC, and then we go to, uh, here's the files there, we can do config.json, this is the JSON uh, objects, Object of all the options that are passed to create that container. So you can actually use this to see, oh, this guy, and then I like the shell script, I just do f grep and figure out if this particular setting is set, and then whether that is, I run some other code. So um, 
That's how this actually how how it's all recorded. So this actually determines how the this shows you how the container was built, which is really nice. Can you explain F-grep? Basically, just F-grep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so F-grep is uh, the grep tool. It stands for fast grep, and it's just a way that it doesn't actually use the extra um, extended. Um, Oh. Special character matching, the oh. regex. It's kind of like the opposite of dash. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, actually, it might even be... What's this? And you're saying f-grep is grep without regular expression? Yes. Now, but I did, I did say extended solution, and I actually, now that I'm thinking about it, I'm not sure if it's extended or if it's just all regular. Just regex. by default, it accepts just, regex, but not extended regex. Can we just use grep? Say again? By default, grep accepts... Uh, some regex, but not extended. That, that is exactly correct. That's correct. And that's what I'm saying. I don't know whether it's the, it's the default standard regex, and the other one's called the extended regex. Uh, so is grep minus E? Huh? Or that's grep? Uh, grep dash capital E is the same as egrep, and that is what gives you the extended regular expression set. But uh, we're talking about F grep, and F grep just does not allow you to use any of the extended. Uh, well, well, this is what I was just talking about. We don't know whether it, it uses the extended, uh, it, it nullifies or get, uh, avoids the extended regular expression set or the entire or the basic regular expression set. There's actually two sets. That's what dash E is. It gives you the extended set. So, um, why would you use FGRIP if you could just. Because it's faster. Because. Uh, well, hold on. I'm not finished asking my question. I, I guess what I was going to ask is couldn't you just not specify a regular expression using grep? Yeah. Is it that much faster? Well, so you would have to escape any regex characters. Yep. Okay. Yeah, yeah fgrep uh, just interprets the pattern as a liberal string. The same as grep hack ass. Okay, so it doesn't need to do the basic sets. So it, it's just a faster way of doing it. So I always recommend, like in shell scripts, where you know the exact pattern to just use that. It's a quicker way to do that, especially in large files. Cool. And we can actually, if we, if we have some two large files, we can, you can actually test it side by side and see what the time is. Yeah, for, for each one. No, actually, I might do that graphic for the next meeting. Um, okay. But yeah, so you get the same man page. So look, if you just go to grep, you go to grep man page, f grep. You can see as what's your name? Sam. Sam. As Sam mentioned, uh, it gives you a little information. You can see that it. Oh, hold on here. He's yeah, he says same as grep dash f. If you look for dash f, let's match that. And uh, it's a fixed string, so just as he said, it's a literal. It matches literally. Um, so in this case, where I have a file with comments, this should not work. If I want to match the hash, uh, what's a good file? Like anything wrong with slave? Should have comments. A a. Com. Should have comments. Yeah. And you can see that that returned one. Okay. And just to verify, um, oh my God, I'm like again, sorry. Matches because it's gonna make our substitution. Oh, so it's back to B here. Yeah, there's comments in there, so it didn't match. That's right. Yep. Okay. So you see that well in uh, uh, it's just just a file that has comments in the first line, so we're just matching the first line. That's the general. It does not work. And if I do it, because if it's though, it finds the finally comments. Because it's matching a literal carrot. If you could do something like that. Oh, yeah. And the hash. It can also be convenient for like searching yeah. through code yeah. when you want to search for things Versus that would otherwise totally that. match with your regex. Right, and you wouldn't have to escape them. Right, yeah. like asterisk or period that match a single or multiple characters. So that's when you would use every right. you know, like, yeah. Yep. Can you well, put that in the notes? They're fairly good. Like that, that command is so right here. Or it's literally a carrot and then whatever character you want to match in the file. Uh, so what, you're wanting to match the all lines that begin with the common character? Yeah. Yeah, that's how you do it. That's what you want in the notes? These two quantities. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, I can remember that. So okay. Quantities so equal. We can substitute them. Bring right. the K equal. And if you were to match something at the end, you just use the dollar sign like this. I know, that would be P. I'll match all the colons at the end line. Oops, got to escape. Uh... Oh. There it is. Okay, so once I put the, the strings around it, that's right from the shell. Okay, so that's how you match everything at the end. Um, okay, so we're done with Docker talk quiz. This will be this will be real short. So I was reading over Christmas break. I was reading a lot of books on neuroscience and memory and stuff. And uh, what I've learned. From uh, 
I did some research on some really good books. And one was uh, my Nobel Prize winning uh, economist and uh, cognitive scientist, uh, Daniel Kahneman, wrote a book called Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow. And it had talked a lot about a lot of different things. And one of the uh, few chapters focused on memory. And there was another one called uh, Make It Stick, uh, The Science of Successful Learning, which is by three uh, well-known uh, cognitive scientists. You can find the book here. It's got really high reviews. Um, and they talk about memory and how to uh, improve your, 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 your cognitive performance and remembering and stuff. So essentially the three takeaways were um, you need to incorporate in your learning. Uh, don't do things like rereading things multiple times, which you need to do. Practice is called retrieval practice. It's essentially the thing this means uh, practice questions, have a quiz. You also need to incorporate a thing called interval and spacing, and they refer to interval as spacing to time out between the quiz. And the idea is the amount of effort that it takes to, to remember something is the, what actually opens up new neural pathways so that you can actually recall it quicker. That's one of the things. So in the, in the case of intervals, if I tell you something, it's easy to remember tomorrow, right? If you do a quiz on it tomorrow, it won't help you that much. But if you do a quiz on it a week later, a month later, to keep spacing out more time, you'll actually be better at remembering it. So you, quickly, you constantly test yourself. And the, um, the spacing was conceptually space out the questions around similar material that is not exactly the same that is, that is related. So particularly if you're talking about Docker, maybe it's particular commands of Docker and the particular options for each particular uh, Docker option, or do uh, arguments for each Docker option just to get the whole thing, or talk about the concept of containers, et cetera. So we, I wrote this, well, me, I started the shell version of this program, and my friend started uh, doing it in PHP. Please, somebody write it in something better <laughs> if you have time. I'm sure uh, it can be written in C very quickly or Python. But essentially, it's just a command line program called Quiz, where you just feed it in a file as a text file, and uh, which is basically a, co a CSV format of questions and answers. And you specify delimiter if you want, but it's not CSV. And it just reads the questions to you. So um, we got, like, I have a bunch of them. So my, my idea is for me to, to, to actually improve my learning, every single book that I'm going to read, I'm going to create a new folder. They just make DR, you know, and then at, create and get the list of things that I find I learned new in a book, write a question out about that particular thing, and then possible option or uh, answers. And then the format is, um, as you can see in the README, is um, the question, the, the question mark, and then CSV. Uh, the first uh, first field is the actual correct answer, and the other the ones after are the ans are other possible answers that you want to have in multiple choice. So when the program parses, it knows that it stores this one in the answer variable, and for these, these are just randomized to the user. And it's just a quick way to, to create a quiz program that you can actually teach yourself things. So in the case of PDFs, you can actually uh, strings or use some other a program to parse PDFs and pull out all the questions using regex and then use that as a basis if you can format it properly for this. So you can actually take textbooks or PDF and make and make quizzes out of this. We did a quick demo. Actually, I don't know what changes have been made since um, it was last done, but um, so let's get full. This is like a fun idea, but how do you like grab text from a PDF in such a way that's not Completely you have to you have to use a program that will just match the, the ASCII. And there there are programs that allow you to parse it. Like, like for example, those PDF to HTML tools and stuff like that, or PDF to text tools. So you have to use one of those. Or I know they, oftentimes they come out with like. Random spaces in the middle of words, or random characters substituted. That, that that's right. It's it's not going to be easy, but if you can if you can do that and use maybe some regex to like trim off that stuff, if presuming there's some, there's some uh, some pattern, you know what I mean. You might be able. I'm not going to say it's easy, but it, you can do it. But I've been doing things by hand. In this particular case, we're going to do dash f, and then I wrote I had a, I read a book on pseudo recently, and so I can specify this pseudo.csv. And it's just so here's the questions. Just, it's a very simple quiz program, right? Yeah. So you can be like, oh, one, correct, and move on to the next one. It's just, just a simple way to do it. I like to add a lot more features, but uh, that's quiz. So if anybody wants to take this and rewrite it, I haven't I haven't actually had time to do anything with it. I've been so busy with my other projects. But I have the shell the start of the shell script. The iffy part with the shell script is sorting it. The quiz is going to have different sorting algorithms. You can do like sequential or randomization or something. But uh, doing that in shells is a little bit tricky, unless you want to use a sort program, which kind of gets uh, uglier. It's a hackish way to do it, but it works. Uh, so there's that. Um, so we're done with quiz. But if anybody wants to add to this, so Linux stuff, if you're working on anything Linux, find it interesting. You can just pull my repo and just send a request and actually have that file full of your questions and answers. Uh, and this is uh, proven, proven, lear pro proven learning techniques. Um, so.
And the last talk is uh, I was appreciative of this. pseudo in depth. We're actually probably not going to go in depth. <laughs> um, so here, who who knows? A lot, who, who's familiar with pseudo? What? Who's familiar with pseudo? Not in depth. At a basic yeah. level. Okay, so fix right. me a sandwich. Huh? Fix me a sandwich. Right. No. <laughs> so um, it's actually a guy that wrote a script that would interact with uh, Jimmy John's website. Yeah. In order to get a sandwich. But it didn't use a make file, which it, I think he missed a. I can joke by skipping that. <laughs> so, um, sudo is a, a program that allows you to run commands as, as another user. Uh, the default is typically root, but it doesn't have to be root. If you have a web server and you want to give uh, a group permission or a user permission to write to that web server, and you want to have another user be able to become that user just temporarily for a particular command, you can do sudo dash u, that username, and then the command they want them to run, for example. So it's a way to uh, provide access control to different users. And it's, it's very good. It's, it's better than just giving them the other user's account. Like if you want to give somebody a root, you don't want to give them the entire shell. With sudo, you can limit the amount of commands that they can run. And for an admin, it's an admin stream tool. But do you need somebody's password to be able to do that? Like for me to run to somebody, or because I'm sudo, I can run it? What'd you say? Like, do I need his? If I want to run, you know, as Devin, oh, do good, I need good. his password? Right. So that's a good point. The thing about sudo is that you only use your password, right? That's the advantage over over uh, su, which stands for switch user. They use the password of the command or of the user that you want to become in that particular case, like su dash dash, right? So I have to know the I have to know the root password to become root. In this case, the dash that says, "Hey, we're going to become root as the default user." Um, you don't need a dash there, do you? No, you don't have to. Isn't the dash you the so environment? That's you, right? Oh, it might be actually. I think you're right. So the dash is an environment variable? No, it no like it, it, it's about here. It like preserves the environment or something. So yeah, you're right. Uh, so I usually just do su. Like you can if I need actually do su root or dash, and then that's right. The sudo. Oh, here it is. Uh, if to find the command, wait, hold on. it's. Uh, Anyways, I, I, I think Devin's right. Uh, that's my bad. So let's look for default. Okay, the default is becoming supervisor. So SU would become supervisor. That's right. So a uh, common way to use SU, I don't have, I don't have, uh, well, he's in the VM. work. Yes. Is, okay, so this will work. Um, SU became root. Um, well, that was, there we go. Okay, so I'm root now. So I had to authenticate with root's password in this particular case. Um, but if you want to do something else, dash c to run a command as that particular user, I want to run cat etsy shadow, right? The shadow file has all the user hashes in it. Uh, if you're using a local authentication, then you can do this. I have to know root's password, which is almost pointless in the case that we need to actually use it to prevent people from becoming root. I'm sorry, that's the wrong. In this case, I actually catch shadow because I became root just for that command using the dash C. And it actually launches a uh, non-interactive uh, shell. Um, so the difference between that and sudo is I don't need no root's password. The root, the root, the administrator of the system can keep the password secret. He doesn't have to tell anybody. You can just delegate things to different particular users. How do you do that? Well, the beauty of the design of sudo is that there's one, it's designed to have one simple configuration file that can be copied through an admin and an organization as hundreds of thousands of systems, you can have that same pseudo worst file copied to all of the systems across the board. And as long as you, have, you, you count, account for every condition or every user or any system, it actually will work. You don't have to maintain different files for every system. So it's, it's excellent in that regard. I don't know why I opened this HD, but I did. I wanted pseudo worst. Okay, so first of all, uh, important use by pseudo. I've learned the hard way in the past for this. Uh, this actually checks so that when you when you actually exit, uh, so my sudo will open up the sudo or file inside of an editor that when it closes out, in this case, you can set it from the editor uh, environment variable. In my case, it'll be Vim. But when you close out of it, it'll actually do syntax checks. And if it finds out it is not valid, then it will let you know and ask you to re-edit the file because if you exit, it's not valid. You could prevent yourself from logging to the system ever again. No. So this uh, looks like it's got, uh, it's using nano, so I need to export my enter variable to say, hey, I want 
to use Vim, and give it all the HTML. Okay, so now I have this open. And defaults, just a number of defaults, and then you can specify the secure path. This is a path to where anything that any program that sudo is going to use needs to be located in. And it will not run programs that are not in that path. So it's, it's called the secure path variable. And the cool thing about this is the uh, the the uh, the 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 the, uh, wow. the syntax, the language that it uses to actually configure it. So by default, it says that this line is for the root user, and the next line says that this is going to match on all hosts. So if you have a system where you have multiple or you have a configuration for all multiple users, this is actually you can use it on different hosts. So I can say, well, I only want to match this on the web server. So only on the web server, if the host name resolves to web, then run the commands as any user that you want, and you can use any command. So the, the, the idea here is user, host, um, commands that you can run as, or users that you can run as, or groups that you can run as, and then the command. So let's just go to a better example that we actually use on handy. Oh, that was handy. Wait, what are those? Oh, yeah, hold on. Let me go to a different one. Uh, so, by the way, real quick, sudo c is how you actually check the sudo files to verify their syntax. So if you ever make a change from the self script, always run this and check the exit code of that. Um, but let's see, sudo d log. So on our, on our dev server, um, for log, which we have, we have. So if, you, if anyone wants access to it, you can have it. We have a, we have a, a Zen project server. You can set up your own VMs if you want to do your own uh, development or stuff. Uh, just let me know. Um, so in this particular case, we created a host alias called dev underscore systems, and that's a VM when this is called dev. So we can assign multiple ones if we want. It can be a web, uh, Docker. So you have multiple in the systems. It's just whatever the host name command uh, resolves to, and we can say that. WQH, which happens to be Devon, um, is allowed to run all commands without a password as root on only the dev system. You cannot touch any other system. And that is because we get De that is Devon's system. That's his development system. I give him full privileges. So Devon is able to do all these things. Now, um, this is how you, how you lock it down. So I, this actually file is copied to each virtual machine as they're created. Another example would be if we want to have Devin run commands as John, whoops, you just put that in there. That, tells, that says when Devin runs sudo, he can use the dash u option to actually run as John, as me, for example. It doesn't have to be root. You could, if you use dash all, then you already can run as any user. You can run as any user. And you can do further limitations. You can do, um, so if you wanted to, Devin is only allowed to run uh, Docker, right? Why? Then you can do that. That way, anytime, so Dev, that's the only program that Devin can run as root, right, in this particular case. So you can specify commands. You can do it like this, Docker. So we can, we'll give, Devin LS as well, right? So you can just put these on there and build them. <laughs> <laughs> Christmas came early. <laughs> <laughs> so that you can actually uh, do a command uh, list like this. So it's like CMND, and then you can actually set a bunch of um, commands here. So we're going to say uh, Devin's, Devin's command, and then you can actually set that with all those ones we just did. And so in this case, we want Devin's allowed to run user uh, bin docker, he's also around user bin ls, <laughs> and then we can just assign um, Devin's commands right here, and then uh, sudo, will, or sudo will take care of the substitution. So that, that's that's the power of sudo. And there's a, there's a lot of cool things in that. One that was recently learned is that you can actually do, um, you can actually do uh, hashing. Sudo has an option you ever set, I take the hash of a program. So I can do MD5 sum of, say, bin ls, get the hash, stick it in the sudo res file as the program at, at, at the command part, and you tell what command it is. And any time a user tries to run that command, if the hash differs from what you specified in the, in the actual file, it will not allow that user to execute the command. So you can actually prevent people from maybe if they're in a Trojan SSHD binary, right? So you can actually say, well, you can't do shit with this unless the hash matches. We know that it's it's the same way it was when we created this configuration. That's never happened on a production system before or anything like that, especially not on campus. SSHD charging? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this would help them in that case. cluster. <laughs> now, one problem with this is you have to update the hash frequently, especially if you apply updates, the binary changes. But it just depends. Maybe you can automate it in some way. Uh, the other thing is, if you come up, here's, a, here's from attacker's perspective and useful for the user as well. But if I were to go on a system and I know I had sudo installed, the first thing I would do is run this command, sudo-l. That actually tells you what your permission, what you're capable of doing. You can see that I can run all commands as root, as all users actually. So um, it tells you which host I can do that on too. So that is that's recommend. I recommend learning this tool. A lot of a bad attackers you'll see in honeypots. They they uh, will just run sudo or try a bunch of stuff and it'll fail. Try some more stuff. Well, literally all they have to do is sudo dash l. They can find out what they're allowed to do. <laughs> So it's the same time too. Um, that's that, when I was still on ACM admin, I know what most people would do as soon as they got an account on the ACM cluster is they'd do a sudo ls to see if they had access to sudo. Okay. And occasionally you get something really funny like sudo make admin get email. <laughs> yeah. It was a really interesting uh, case study. Nice, nice. Yep. So yeah, here it is. So in a case where it was allowed to run those particular commands and they wouldn't know it. Say they logged into an account where you had the, you know how we listed the specific commands? Like, do, like in the kid Devin's case, user bin docker at bin ls. They would try all these other commands except those two commands maybe, right? And then those would, all the other ones would fail but they didn't know that they actually had permissions to these two commands that they could that may potentially abuse of, of the system. It just depends. But yeah, so it's, it's pretty useful. Um, so you can check individual files, dash f, if you just want to verify, uh, I want to do sudoers, sd, I want to verify the log file, and you see that just oh, it become complete sudo for that. And then check parsing is correct. If I mess it up, it'll let me know. You don't want to do that, though. I'll break the shit. Um, sure, I'm trying to think. I'm just some of this off the top of my head. I'm trying to think of is there anything else that was particularly important? Like um, for the turn and hold. Do those limitations oh, and how it's not. Not quite the same as SDA into root. Yeah, so uh, we talked about how um, I think the big advantage is that you can delegate particular um, commands on particular hosts for particular users uh, without knowing the password or the how that user authenticates um, that, that, that particular user that you want to become. In this particular case, sudo just uses your your level of authentication. It will just pass with your password. So. Um, that's the big difference between sudo and su. Um, how, there, do you, how do you block sudo tag at? Uh, if you pass the uh, dash s flag to sudo, it'll give you a shell. That's correct. Um, how do you block that? Let's try. Uh, what you can do is well, the, the, there's a question here. Um, does the use the user have you? We presume a situation where a user has access to sudo dash s, right? Well, no, I mean, like, how do you either give or deny permission to it? it like, sudo su, you could give them permission to the su binary or deny them permission to the su binary. For sudo tag dash s, would you just, like, allow them to do it by putting in the shell uh, thing, or? Well, uh, you can actually, in, in the in the sudoers command, uh, or the sudo configuration file, you can actually match on uh, command line options. So you can deny that particular particular one as like a blacklist and everything else is whitelisted. Uh, I'll give you an example of that. Uh, let's see, I got, I got a config. But it's like whitelisted by default, right? I've never explicitly allowed it. You'd have to explicitly deny it. Okay. Yeah. But the, the thing here is um, what, you're, I mean, as an administrator, you do not want to give the ability to your users to, do, to just become anything, right? Uh, so in the case where you would restrict the yeah. commands, you would restrict, hey, you're only allowed to use these commands, and then you can't match anything with this particular command line option for the sudo or binary at the top. Block all these. Like if some admins will create a list of hundreds of options and, and arguments that will not be allowed to use with the binary, for example. Okay. It's a pain in the ass, but I think it's a way. I think it's a way to solve your problem. Um, I haven't done it myself. Okay, so I can't speak for it. Another thing I want to point out is running things as a sudo, is it really the same as suing into root? A few things don't work. For example, you can't sudo echo uh, stuff into the proc file system. 
That is correct. You'd have to use T. And the re the reason for that is because yes. Echo is a shell built in. Uh, yeah, or you can also do sudo bash dash c and then put the command in there. Would it? So yes. you're saying it would work to do like slash bin slash echo? Yes, okay. I believe so. We can, we'll, we'll test it real quick, just to be just to be sure. For, uh, so sudo bin echo, right? And then we want to pipe uh, some data into say Etsy password the variant. And this, oh, this particularly, I'm sorry, I'm going to do my box, so I do have permissions to do this. One second. I switched, I forgot. So, Hammy, I have permissions, you're right. Mm -hmm. I you thought do I have permissions, you're right. I to Pseudo bin. Oh, maybe not. Do you, that's awesome. So that doesn't work either. I really want now, why wouldn't that one work? Because I'm pretty sure it was the fact that it was a shell built in. And... But like and that's the shell function, you just do you pseudo with it. Yeah. I'm guessing it's because you're redirecting sure. to no, no, that's file. Not, which I mean, try, try to you can see you're directing the text into the program that's right into the file. Getting a great board, great degree. You're directing the text. Ah, yeah, yeah, that's, that's right. Out of the class, huh? it's, oh, it's, it's an issue with standard out, standard error. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, that makes sense. That, that's that yeah, that that is right. Nice. Okay, cool. Check. Um Don't sure I think you want to run some of these elevated privileges, mm -hmm. but to make the output be your file, you can do that. Yeah. That's right. Yep, that is right. Um oh. so yeah. well, wait, are you saying that um right now Bash is trying to take the standard out of the pseudo <laughs> command and do that? So like, what if you put that part in like a subshell or something? <laughs> Which part? This part? Yeah, like the whole command except for sudo. Yeah. Be great in it. yeah. First of all, let's uh, make sure uh, it's being echo. Or just because I want so much. Sure. Yes. Yes. Sir. Okay. So that like it does not work. Um, or however you do. Yeah. This is kind of like this was like kind of introduction. What you can do, the way the way that you would actually do something like that, though, is um, you'd spot, like Devin said, you could do the bash. And that would actually echo that idea. I'm just wondering the reason. I'm wondering if the, if the reason is because bash is trying to apply the standard out redirection um, to the command and not part of the pseudo yeah. operator. Yeah, the, like that's handled by itself. So the pseudo runs the command and then gives your text back to Z, or bash, and then yeah. bash writes to a file. You're the one who's running bash. Right. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. So when you run bash, it's elevated. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, any other questions? Not um, one other thing is, when you use, uh, for users, they can do, uh, there's a few different options. We talk, He talked about the, the dash shell option. Um, and that's different from the dash i option, which actually gives you an interactive shell. Right, and you'll find out that the variable set between these two things are different. We can actually test that a little bit. So, um, let me just a moment to think about that. So, diff um, sudo dash i, and we're going to do set. Oh, no, we want to do process substitution here. I believe. And then you want to do sudo. <laughs> Dash F, and then you want to say, um, can we just do a command like that? Let's try that. I forget. Yeah, you yes, okay, you can do that. So you can see here's the difference between the two. The first one actually is an interactive shell, and the second one is not. It's uh, So we have a difference in variables. So in, let's actually make the output a little bit prettier. So dash U and W. Oops, let me scroll down like that. Um, we actually have. Hmm. Okay, so in this particular case, where the first one, it looks like the dash set, that's what inherits my environment variable for home. Rather, the interactive shell will actually load the profile script, Etsy profile, and that of the root user, so root.profile or bash underscore profile in that particular case. However, in the case where you use the dash s option, or this, yeah, the case where you use the dash s option, it does not do that. You, you keep the home directory or the environment variables of the current user rather than that of the user you're becoming as the shell. Not to mention, S, I'm not sure if it keeps your shell or it starts with a shell the same type, but if you're in Z, you have to use that as your user shell and you have bash set to be the default market shell of root, S will go and keep your Z and I will open bash. Really? Okay, I didn't know that. I never used uh, ZSH. 
Uh, another thing is, uh, so you can use sudo as a particular user. So you can use sudo dash u. Uh, I want to become Wayland. Check. Uh, Don't we all? Kitty. Kitty. Okay, so sudo dash u. That is Wayland. That's a particular command that I want to execute as Wayland. Um, I can do bash as Wayland. We can see that I am now the Way Wayland, his user, and then I've interrupted the shell that actually pulled up some information from the, the various scripts. Um, so there's that. I did. I said the same thing. But this particular case, the home, is, the home is still JShip, and that's what you need to try because that one did not invoke an interactive shell that actually called upon the profile scripts that bash had on. So therefore, I'm, I'm, I am I am Wayland now. However, my home directory is not JShip. Um, there's a few other options um, that are useful. Um, you can become, you can run a, crap, a command as a particular group. So I can do dash G and say wheel, for example, or something. Um, of course, it's useful. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, you ever use uh, sudo edit? Hi. That's a way you can like use a, a, an editor, like Vim or something, uh, as a sudo user without having them to be able to d escape out and get a shell with like you know a colon shell or, or, or the exclamation point and then some command if they're that as root. Uh, sudo edits a program that allows you to do that. Hmm. Yeah, um, the way it works is it allows you to edit the file first, not add the permissions of the user, but then it would actually co copy that to a buffer, and then once you exit that, sudo then copies that to the appropriate file. That's cool. yeah. the way you're using the Vim or Emacs or RC. Yeah. RC yeah. Yeah. You're a user instead of the root user. Right. Yep. So um, I've been relying on that stupid T trick. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. I still have that in my in my Vim R, my Vim RC, but I, I haven't even used it yet. I just, uh -huh. I, just, I just forget to use it. Yeah. But see you later, man. Take off. Yeah. See you guys Thursday, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yep. But like, do we already turn in the files? I mean, uh, slides for. NSM. I have updated both of the slides. I've updated for log, I updated for open NSM, but if we wants to add anything more to log, you can. You did NSM and log? Yeah. So, Devin, you're going to come too? Right now, yeah. No, I meant oh, to. Yeah. yeah, in the case for like CD, um, <laughs> the way reason CD doesn't work is you just execute as a command like that, and then you're automatically back to where you were. After, so you don't actually end up in the directory that you executed to. But so, uh, I don't, I don't know. You know, I guess we're done. But there was, there was a book that's really good, and it covered actually a lot of that stuff you talked about with the, with the redirection. Um, it's called Pseudo Mastery. I just kind of forgot a lot. Uh, I forgot a lot of it. But that's why I got that quiz of all those things. So I need to go practice that. Uh, but yeah, it's a really good book. You can get it for like ten bucks. Cool. And it's like a hundred some pages. So I, I I literally read it in like two hours. So what do you what do you guys want to do? Like me and you do signet, and them two guys do lug or what? It's them two. Me and Wayland. Devin and Wayland. I thought Wayland wasn't going. He's going. He thought it was on Wednesday. Oh, okay, I was going. Wednesday is lunch at twelve thirty, right? Man, why'd you pick Perkins? Because it's close and it's, it's cold disgusting. out. It's disgusting. It's not that. Uh, I had a pretty good steak there last time I went. <laughs> no, I mean, for, I know. I mean, for for like a. For like a ten fifteen dollar range. The chicken figure sandwich is pretty good. What where is that? Pebble charger. I don't know. I was asking that too. Right over here. Just leave it there, and then they'll find it. Whoever it was. Oh okay. Thank you. All right, that concludes. Love. It was funny because I said that to everybody else, and I was like, oh, but watch, Wayland is gonna complain about it. Marcus Perkins. Come on, I can't be the only person. I'm not gonna stop it. It's convenient.